everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Cover My Meds. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions to the panelists throughout the discussion. Stay on for expert mythologist Natasha, who will be shaking things up with a refreshing cocktail demonstration. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Cover My Meds, David Holliday. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, as you said, my name is David Holliday, and I'm the president of Cover My Meds, which is a healthcare IT company that helps patients get the medications they need to live healthy lives. I'm joined today by three remarkable healthcare experts who will discuss technology's impact on access, adherence, and affordability of medications. Uh, first up is Nicole uh, Braccio. She's a licensed pharmacist and policy director at National Patient Advocate Foundation. Welcome, Nicole. Uh, next is Dr. Patrick McGill, uh, is EVP and Chief Analytics Officer of Community Health Network. Welcome, Dr. McGill. And finally, Dr. Melissa Reiser, Chief Clinical Information Officer of the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Welcome, Dr. Reiser. Uh, throughout this discussion, we'll highlight key findings from the 2021 Medication Access Report, an annual report that uses industry research, patient interviews, and new survey data to investigate medication access barriers and how we can overcome them as an industry by utilizing technology, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a lot to get through today, so let's get started uh, with one uh, cute comment to start. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but the bobbleheads that we saw at the beginning of the characters probably had better moves than I do on a normal dance floor. I uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. Very nice by the team. Um, our first question, the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated trends that were already in motion, and it is leaving a lasting impact. In fact, the 2021 Medication Access Report found that 65% of patients surveyed were financially affected by COVID-19, and 36% of patients sacrificed their treatment or medications to pay for bills and basic needs. I'd like to hear from the panel about some of the medication access barriers patients commonly face especially in the past year and the impact this has, has had across this industry. Uh, Dr. Reiser, let's, let's start with you. Great, thank you, David. And thank you for asking me to participate in this panel discussion. It's a true honor to be able to talk a little bit about the access report and then certainly to talk about issues that our patients have and in, in being able to obtain medications that they so desperately need. I wanna to add to the fact that the access report also identified that greater than 25% of that employed population lost their jobs during this past year, as well as the great job that the access report did in telling Ashley's story, which honestly is not unlike many of my patients who chose not to even come to their appointments as they didn't have the money for a copay let alone the money for meds that might or could be prescribed within that visit. I think we even saw the hesitancy of our patients when we started to ramp up telehealth that they were concerned about whether that visit would be covered or not until the government stepped in and said, you know, we'll cover those visits. So I think all across the board in that healthcare arena, that ability to have the money to be able to access some of those things within healthcare, whether it's your physician, whether it's your medication, is extremely important. And the piece of having the conversation between the physician and the patient about the cost of medication is something that clearly doesn't happen frequently enough, nor is it really readily accessible to the physician at the time of rendering the prescription. And I think that we're gonna talk a little bit more about that today and the, the true importance of a real-time benefit um, prescription service. So I, I think those kind of summarize what I have noticed within my practice and with our patients here at Ohio State. Yeah, and if it's okay, I can jump in here. Um... So thank you, Dr. Reiser. I think, you know, certainly there has been such uh, uncertainty in the healthcare system, both for patients and clinicians, pharmacists, and all of the above. Um, 
From my perspective, the patient perspective, I work at National Patient Advocate Foundation and our sister organization, Patient Advocate Foundation, is seeing a lot of these same trends in terms of the financial hardship that people are facing. Um, patient Advocate Foundation primarily serves lower income patients by the ones in navigating the healthcare system and connecting them to government as well as community su uh, supports. So I think you know, we did a survey actually um, in May of 2020 and then a follow-up in December to see what are the issues that people are facing the most. Um, and of course, you know, being able to see a doctor was certainly top of mind as well as you know, some of the challenges with telehealth and really understanding the costs associated with that. So couldn't agree more. Um, and I think you know, because of this patient population that we serve already you know, may be facing financial hardship, we did see an uptick in the amount of distress people were facing due to losing their jobs, um, but really just all the compounding elements um, that this pandemic has thrown at us. Yeah, and I, I appreciate being asked to, to speak today, David. I, I, I think this is an incredibly important topic for, for healthcare in general. But, you know, I think the pandemic, I, I echo what Dr. Reiser had to say, you know, I think the pandemic with all of the uh, surrounding impacts with people losing their job and the financial hardships and, and the impact on their, um, their family and, and not only themselves, but, but they're also their mental health and well-being you know, being concerned about coming back into the healthcare system, is it safe? And, you know, do they have access to a, a virtual methodology to see their provider? I think that's, those are all questions that, you know, we all struggled with over the last year. And, and I think price was just one more uh, aspect of that and, and the financial affordability of many drugs. You know, this question wasn't unique or, or due to the pandemic. I think it was accelerated by the pandemic uh, because of all the external forces. I think Price transparency when it comes to medications and cost uh, to the patient or their costs has always been a question, you know, increasing over the last few years with, with the rise in cost of medications. And I think that the external stresses of the pandemic uh, actually brought it to the forefront. We see price transparency being, you know, one of the most important things when it comes to uh, patient behavior, consumer behavior, uh, when interacting with the healthcare systems. And it's no different when it comes to medications. I, I, I think that this is this is just shined a bright spotlight on an already longstanding ex existing problem. I, I agree with that. Um, you know, the, the healthcare industry has been facing this for a while now. I, in tying back to price, quality, and convenience as uh, factors of us having uh, the ability to actually consume healthcare in a in a real way. Do you see patients uh, beginning to ask about the cost of their medication in the exam room? Oh, absolutely. I think this is this is something that that patients have been asking for for asking about for a long time. You know, unfortunately, up until recently, we have as a as a practicing family physician, we haven't had a great answer um, to give the patient. You know, we we kind of have an idea of what medications cost, but you never really know what the medication cost to the patient, you have a ballpark idea of what the overall cost is, but in terms of what their copay would be or have they met their deductible or is it covered, what tiers and on, those are questions that have always seemed very uh, black box-ish to a, to a practicing physician when they're sitting in front of a patient. And you know, we've implemented or tried to implement uh, several technologies to help clinicians at the point of prescribing with some of the real-time benefit information and the electronic prior, author prior authorization if needed uh, those tools are, are becoming very helpful at the point of prescribing to allow uh, a real conversation between providers, doctors, and the patient to say, you know, this, this medication, I, I feel like it might be the best one for you. You know, is this, a, is this a, a situation where we need to look for alternative means or maybe patient assistance or other financial assistance for affordability? We know that the number one reason patients don't take their medications is, is affordability and and that starts at the point of prescribing. You know, I would agree with you, Patrick. I, um, it's been a long time frustration for me and the fact that a lot of times, you know, we have patterns in which we prescribe over time and we're used to using those particular medicines, but they may not be on the formulary. And you think that you've got an answer and then it turns around that you find this prior authorization that pops up and you go, 
I, I don't really care. I just want to know what can the patient get? How can we get it to them the, the most inexpensive way? Just tell me what they can, just tell me what is on their formulary. And up until now, that's been really, really difficult to find out. I know you've probably spent hours on the phone like I have and like my staff has trying to figure out, just tell me what med they can get. I don't wanna do a prior authorization. I don't wanna cost anybody more money than what we need to spend, but trying to get that information has been so difficult. And in a busy practice day, that's really hard to do when you're seeing patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think even in the community pharmacy setting, when conversations aren't happening in the office, they can also happen at the pharmacy counter. And that's where sort of the, you know, the dreaded runaround happens where a patient is kind of having to communicate between the, the doctor's office, the pharmacy and the insurance company. Um, and a lot of that, the pharm pharmacies can help guide, but there's certainly lack of information without real-time benefit tools. So I think that has definitely improved the process and made conversations a little bit easier. Um, but I also think that there is a very slow and steady shift happening where people are feeling comfortable talking about uh, affordability and finances with healthcare providers in general. So I think, you know, it's not the end um, of these conversations happening and we can hope to see this happen more. Nicole, that's that's a great segue. Um, we know that healthcare often lags behind other industries regarding use of technology to improve consumer engagement uh, by as much as ten years, as we found on the the medication access report. Where in where in the workflow are we seeing the best application of technology to help improve patient experience and outcomes? And you know, pre-visit, during the visit, or post-visit, and as Nicole mentioned, even at the pharmacy counter itself. Uh, Dr. McGill, would you like to start this one? Sure. I think this is a this is a great question. Something we you know try to address every day um, within Community Health Network, and you know I think that really at the point of prescribing, a lot of the a lot of the uh, situations we've just described really start at the point of prescribing. So to Dr. Reiser's point, you know, it's not that not that a physician necessarily wants a certain uh, medication or, um, you know, maybe a class of medications, but just knowing which medication is, is covered and on formulary is, is very important. And, you know, I think at the point of prescribing, uh, it's, it's very important. Um, a lot of this uh, also prior authorization work is, is handed off to uh, office support staff. And so being able to use electronic tools to, to automate that, you know, one thing back to the pandemic, you know, we've all been short staffed prior to the pandemic, the pandemic with people being quarantined, et cetera, has made that um, significantly worse. And so, um, you know, I think having electronic means to address some of these things, um, prior authorization and, and, and real time benefit notification uh, at the point of prescribing and then after is, is very important. Uh, let me just add one other thing about the last question. You know, I think that because I think it ties into the to the point of prescribing at, in the exam room conversation, you know, I think some of these things have been exacerbated by uh, additional uh, some of the Me Too drugs that are being developed in the classes and, and you know, having multiple drugs in, in a certain medication class, while very helpful and beneficial in a lot of ways, exacerbates the problem because we don't know which one is covered. We know we want them on a certain class of drugs. Uh, efficacy is pretty much the same for the patient. You know, just tell us which one is covered. And then the other thing that I see uh, as a physician, you know, is is the increase in the mail order pharmacy. So to Nicole's point, in a lot of ways, we've lost that that interaction with the local pharmacy who knows the patient, who knows the medications, who knows what insurance will cover, and can have that informed conversation. And as we've seen the rise of mail order pharmacies, you know, a lot of times it's, and in, in with the rise of electronic prescribing, it's, there is no conversation. It, the medication gets sent to the mail order pharmacy, it shows up in the mail, uh, you know, the patient is charged, and then there is no opportunity for, an, for a conversation. So pushing that upstream to the point of prescribing, I think, is, is incredibly impactful to this problem that we're talking about today. And Patrick, I think it's even more important that as you look at those pharmacies, those mail order pharmacies, and the fact that they have the auto renewal and those pills just keep coming and coming and coming, 
And at different times, it may be a different generic that the patient gets. And then they're really confused because the pink pill is now a green pill. And even though it's the same formulation, it looks different to the patient and it becomes more confusing. And now they have more medicines than what they need. And that becomes even more confusing. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I think it's extremely important. Nicole, anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I, well, I think, you know, what you're describing there, Dr. Reiser and Dr. McGill is, you know, a great example of sort of the psychosocial, emotional roller coaster that patients face when they're, you know, see sticker shock at the pharmacy and thinking about, you know, how, what can I do to improve the affordability so that I can actually pick this up? So I think there's, you know, a lot um, beyond just being able to access the medication, but a lot going on, um, you know, in people's heads as, you know, they're facing sort of this, um, these barriers. You know, the, the different paths to medication vary based on our life experiences and environment. And in our medication access report, uh, uh, we found that one in five providers aren't asking about social determinants of health. And I know that just that term determinants has got a, in and of itself a conversation for us to have. How can encouraging these open conversations enhance patient visits? And how do you recommend patients and their care teams start engaging in this dialogue? Uh, Nicole, let's start with you as an advocate here. Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, happy to talk about social determinants of health. I'm extremely pleased to see that as such a focus of the medication access report this year. And maybe just to do a little bit of level setting, when we're talking about social determinants of health, these are, you know, as defined, these are the social and economic conditions in which people live, work, play, et cetera, that influence people's health. So I think there's you know, there may very well be partnerships within technologies that can help to address sort of these underlying foundational issues. But I think we all need to recognize that that is a much bigger picture than just being able to access medication. And at the same time, as a result of these social determinants of health comes the financial and social needs that we as an industry, as the healthcare system must address sort of on a one-to-one -one basis. And that becomes really challenging. Um, because everyone has different needs, but I think encouraging conversations in the doctor's office, in the clinical setting, um, and encouraging these conversations to revolve around people as a whole person beyond just their disease, I think will start to address some of these challenges. Yeah, I completely agree with what, what Nicole has to say. You know, you know, I think it's incredibly important. I think it's been a, a, an overlooked area for, for many years. And I do think that if, if anything positive with the pandemic has come out, it's that you know, the, the increased awareness on the impact of social determinants on, on people's well-being and, and their lives in general. We have taken the approach at, at Community that we want to, and we actually have it as a network goal this year, to improve and increase the screening for social determinants. And so we've launched an initiative um, to, to screen all patients at their annual wellness or, or annual exam uh, for social determinants. And then, you know, we're also measuring how many patients screen positive, how many patients, um, you know, have a need that, that needs to be addressed and, and, and we're committed to getting them connected to the, to the uh, community benefit organizations to address those needs. But, and, and to echo what Nicole said, you know, where else is it is it more appropriate to ask and address some of these questions, but in the in the doctor's office and in the, in the exam room? And while it might be uncomfortable uh, for some to answer or even admit uh, that they have an issue that they need help, um, so we've we've started to offer this uh, electronically. They can do it before the visit. They can do it, you know, in the privacy of their own home, where it's not not as um, uh, uncomfortable, but I think it's absolutely an imperative that, that we as a healthcare system have to start to address uh, these social determinants. And, and as we're talking about cost of healthcare, if we don't focus on some of these, we'll never really bend the curve on, the, on, on healthcare costs. I absolutely agree with you both. And I, I think it's extremely important. Certainly Ohio State has taken on that same attitude 
that you described, Dr. McGill, and making sure that we cover those things, at least in the annual visit, and certainly as often as we can get the opportunity during regular visits. But I think even more so now, even on top of all of those social determinants of health that we're aware of is what we've thrown on with technology and access to the internet. And how do I get to all of these electronic things that we're now saying, oh, you can fill this out from home before you come in. We know from the access report that a lot of our patients have cell phones, but we also know that some of them have a basic understanding of how to use them and maybe not how to use those apps that we give them to be able to access some of that information that we're sharing. We are seeing it in the younger generation as they, as that is becoming certainly a part of their life and they're able to navigate that a little bit better, but that's a whole nother layer on top of it. And I think as we developed and grew from telehealth visits of 90 per month prior to March of last year to over 30,000 visits in the month of December here at Ohio State, we know that our physicians as well as our patients struggled with making sure that they could make that connection. And initially, as we rolled these out, everything fell to a telephone visit as opposed to a video visit because patients didn't have the bandwidth at home to be able to do a video visit. And I think that's another really important challenge is how do we get those tools to everyone who needs them to be able to meet these basic needs that our patients have? Um, to be able to access that care, especially during a pandemic, especially during these times of when you know people were afraid to come into the office, people were afraid of exposure, and certainly some were quarantined and shouldn't be out and be exposed. So I think it has forced us to really address that financial impact more now so than ever before. You, know, you, you all, uh a couple of times through the conversation have mentioned a, a new way uh, that we're delivering healthcare and, it, and not necessarily a completely new way, but definitely more pronounced uh, with meetings like we're having here today uh, with the patients. How are you finding that, uh, that the uptake on that approach? And you know, this is a bit of a delicate subject talking about social determinants of health. How's that going with this new process where we're sitting behind screens talking to each other? start us off on this. Well, I can tell you in my practice, there are, there's a dichotomy. There are um, certainly patients who said, I'll wait until I can see you in the office and I'll see you mm -hmm. then. And that oftentimes tends to be our older population that are used to that, that need for touch, that need for that close communication and, and that access to that person one-on-one -on -one in an office. Some people's homes are not set up for a private conversation and they're un uncomfortable having that kind of a conversation in their home. They can't find an isolated place. And as we learned in the pandemic, there are many places, certainly in Ohio, where there are numbers of families who all live together in one household. And we became very well aware of that as COVID spread immediately through those families. And so I think, you know, for some groups, it was very much, I wanna get back to that normal that I'm so comfortable with in my doctor's office. But then we saw others that we've never seen in the office before access healthcare in a way that they're very comfortable with and having it through a video conversation. And again, I think as long as you have the appropriate approach, the conversation becomes easier. And, and I think that's a part of how we need to educate our medical students. How do you have this conversation? Mm -hmm. How do you enter into making sure that as you prescribe something, not only can they afford it, but can they read the prescription that you just wrote? Can they actually read what is on the bottle? What's their literacy level? Can, do they have a way to get to the pharmacy to get it? Or do you need to think about a pharmacy that can deliver their medications to them? I mean, it's all of those things that are access points to getting the patient from the point in which you tell them you need this to the point in which they have it. 
And Dr. Reiser, I'm so glad you brought up that as an example or of you know, tr uh, skilled communications training for medical students and clinicians. And I think at MPIF, we're thinking we're on the same um, on the same wavelength with you there because we're doing a lot of work to educate patients and caregivers themselves in communities to be able to have these conversations to know what words do you use to get the care that you need. And um, just responding to Dr. McGill's point earlier, um, you know, screening for financial and social needs, screening for social determinants of health is one of uh, the most important goals um, that we have at NPAF around making sure that that screening happens so that people are receiving support and navigation. But in order to initiate that process, you you really need to know what are the top of mind needs. And some of them are you know, basic living necessities like food, energy, um, you know, paying their utility bills. And again, it is uncomfortable to talk about this in the context of your health sometimes, um, but that's a you know, major reason why our community campaigns at NPAF are addressed on exactly that, making talking about what matters to you um, just as important about talking around what is the matter with you. So if you can see that um, the alignment is, you know, something that people need to prepare for and really feel confident in before they even walk into that office. Well, I really like that uh, what matters to you versus what is the matter with you uh, conversation. It is a balance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. McGill, uh, I'll ask a follow on for this is um, since COVID has uh, hit us and we've been dealing with uh, more people that are in the unemployed space and uh, higher pressures on, on our economic uh, situations. Have you seen an uprise in the number of conversations? We've talked about how we're having conversations with the patients, but patients asking for the dialogue from us. Yeah, actually we have, and it's, it's interesting as we launched the social determinants initiative to, to screen patients, you know, the feedback that we get is, is wow, you know, nobody's ever asked me these questions before, uh, whether it's in a healthcare system or somewhere else. And, and, you know, I think that, I think that most of the time you have a few people that kind of question, why are you asking me these questions? Because it is outside of the normal experience that they've had with healthcare, but for the majority, um, you know, they're, they're appreciative and they recognize uh, to Nicole's point about trying to treat the whole person and the whole person is more than just their diabetes or their high blood pressure. It's, it's all of their needs um, that they might, that they might have, you know, to echo one of the points that Dr. Reiser was making, you know, that, that one of the things that I did, do think the pandemic highlighted was the point that she was making about the, the patients who don't have access to reliable internet uh, or, or cell phone service. And, and, and we saw the same thing. And so, you know, we, we actually added that to our social determinant screen, screener is do you have access to reliable internet and um, cell phone service? Not that, you know, we're going to you know, we'll partner or we'll, we'll work to get them connected. Um, but I think that that does um, have an impact into the digital adoption and some of the digital transformation that healthcare is undergoing right now. And if they don't have reliable access, you know, essentially during the pandemic, when, when everything was shut down, they were excluded. So in some ways, if we don't have a solution, then it, then it drives a further divide uh, in some of these social determinants um, that, that we see. And I think one of the things that we should do and, and learn from, uh, which is part of the approach that we've taken, is to learn from the school system. You know, the schools, when everybody went home last spring and everything was virtual, the schools had the exact same problem with, with patients or students, per se, not having access to, to reliable uh, internet access at home. And so, you know, this is a similar problem that we could partner with school systems uh, to, to come up with a solution um, so I, you know, I, I do think it's, it's, it's very important and we do see, uh, more people willing to have the conversation if it's done in a respectful, um, you know, caring way, it, 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 it can't be just another survey that they have to take. It has to, you have to have that, that caring relationship. And, and, and the last thing I'll say about doing, um, you know, the, the virtual visits with my patients and, and, and I've been a family physician for 20 years. In some ways, it is helpful to to know uh, to have to do a video visit and have a glimpse uh, into their living situation. And if they are living with multiple families, and a lot of times, if when you have a longstanding relationship, they're very happy to 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 let you in their house. It kind of goes back to it's a, it's the new 
a home visit, right? And, and the relationship that doctors used to have with their patients when they would do home visits. And um, it's, just a, it's just a new way to do it. But it's, it's, um, it, it does, I think, in some ways deepen that patient-physician bond. Excellent. I'm, I'm going to pull one of the questions from our audience here. Uh, it, it was a focus on, uh, I'll paraphrase a bit, but it was a focus on what about the dichotomy between our senior population who may not have tech savvy capabilities and those who do? Sounds like we've got some opportunities where we're working on technology. How do we ensure that our seniors are pulled into this conversation as well? Uh, and it, again, focusing on the fact that uh, it's not the, the easiest conversation to have. And I'll also open that up in a broader statement for you to give you some cues on uh, where in the visit process do we think that works the best? I think our seniors would surprise you. When we initially rolled out my chart, which is our patient portal, um, we thought, oh yeah, we'll probably get those 40 year olds. Oh no, we were getting the 80 year olds and our 90 year olds who were signing up for the patient portal and messaging their physician back and forth. Now, their grandchildren may be the ones that were helping them do that. But as we have rolled out vaccine, which um, the signup has been most expeditious through our MyChart portal, we have seen every age group use it. And when I talk to them as I'm giving them vaccine, I am constantly surprised at how they complement our MyChart experience for mm -hmm. them. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily put all of our seniors into a bucket and say, you know, how do we help them? I think, how do we address this across the board? How do we make sure that everybody understands and has access? I don't think that we can target one specific group. I think we really do need to look along, all along the age group and make sure that we're targeting all of them to make sure they understand how to access, how to access information about their meds and different medication groups and where they can get the best discount on their pharmaceuticals. And the same as how do I access my doctor? How can I um, communicate with them in the best way? Yeah, I would have said the same thing. I, I mean, I, I would have I would have asked the same question five years ago about about seniors um, and and technology. Uh, I agree with Dr. Reiser. It, when you look at the studies, and we've seen the same thing, my chart utilization doesn't drop off until after ninety, actually. And some of the seniors are the more engaged uh, patients in the portal. I do think again, one of the things that the that the pandemic has helped with is is the adoption of video for the senior population, because this is also how they're seeing their family, their grandchildren, their friends, you know, they're Zooming, you know, card card games and Zooming uh, to be able to see. So I do think that um, while five years ago, we may have said seniors had trouble with video conferencing or video visits, that's not the case anymore. This is how they're living their lives uh, for the most part. Um, and so, it, I, I echo what Dr. Reiser said. We don't see a drop off. It's actually the younger folks who who um, don't really engage with the portals, and it's probably because they don't really have a need, unless they have a a, a chronic disease or you know consistent interaction with the health system. Um, those are the ones that engage with the portal. Yeah, it certainly is surprising to see, you know, how digital technology has you know been taken up by all these different popula patient population groups. Um, in our telehealth survey, we have some preliminary data to show you know, trends in like telehealth utilization among different um, books of business. So you know how the Medicaid population was one, Medicare, and then private insurance. And believe it or not, there was it was very even across the board, with a slight decrease in the number of Medicaid patients who were logging on to telehealth visits. Um, but I think part of that, you know, also has to do with the socioeconomic um, circumstances. And you know, I, there's a lot of research to show that. Um, telehealth is less accessible for especially um, older adults of color living in you know, certain um, marginalized communities. So there's just so many factors to consider here, which I think everyone here has said, you know, kind of taking an individual approach and you know, being able to address everyone across the board, accounting for individual differences in understanding and access to technology. So I think this will continue to be, you know, an important focus for health equity moving forward. 
Really like that. Thank you all for the feedback on the senior population. I know in my family, uh, you separate a grandparent from a grandchild and there's an iPad around, they will figure out how to use it. And I think that's playing through very well and what we're seeing here in the healthcare uh, situation as well. Um, I wanna move to our, our wrap up questions so we can get to some Q and A as well. Uh, the different paths to medications vary by our life experience. I'm oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, we've had a, a thoughtful conversation today about medication access barriers and how we can overcome them as an industry. I'd like to wrap up with a few predictions for the future. Uh, based on what we've observed from the, this past year. Uh, who'd like to go first with your predictions? I'm happy to go first and, and get that over with. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think we're going to see a lot more use of real-time pharmacy benefits. I, I hope we are so that we can wrap that up in the office, not have a lot of other stuff that has to happen outside of the office visit with um, prior authorization and phone calls that go back and forth about medications. I hope that we can make that much, much smoother. Clearly, we're going to see a whole lot more use of technology. And so I think trying to make it so that people have access to the internet across the board, no matter where they are, no matter what their socioeconomic status is, I think is going to be really important in the future. And I'm in hopes that our government sees that just the same as what our institution has reached out with several pilot programs to supply internet access to our patients, especially our pregnant patients who may not have access. So I'm really hopeful for that in the future, as well as something that Dr. McGill said earlier that I am so supportive of, which is transparency. Price transparency, access transparency, transparency across the board for our patients so that they know the best place to go to seek care, the best place to go to seek their medications, but to give them that in a very easy way to access it. And that has never been true from a pharmaceutical benefits approach. And so I'm really hopeful for that. And then, and then the last one is really affordability so that we can make choices so much easier for patients. Yeah, I actually echo everything that Dr. Reiser said. I think that technology and healthcare is is definitely here to stay. It's going to be an expectation uh, that patients and uh, providers are going to have. I don't think that there's going to be any turning back. And and I agree. I'm hopeful that the reimbursement and the the adoption is is supported by um, the the payers and the government. One thing that I think that that's that's connected to technology, but it's going to make the technology even that more important is I do think that we're, we're going to see, we, we've heard about burnout with, with clinicians, but especially nurses and physicians beforehand. I think that the pandemic um, obviously accelerated that in a lot of ways. I think we're going to see a lot of folks that made it through the pandemic and, and said, you know what, I, I'm, I'm done with healthcare. I, I, I contributed when I could during the pandemic, but um, I'm going to go a different direction. And so we've always had uh, staffing uh, concerns, whether it's nurses or physicians or pharmacists, you know, shortages. And I think that that's only going to get worse uh, over the next um, one to three to five years. Um, and I think that that makes the, the, the use of technology and some of these efficiencies even that much more important. Uh, real-time um, benefit tools, uh, real-time clinical decision support, uh, automation, artificial intelligence, those types of technologies are going to be um, absolutely critical because of some of the other factors that are going on, such as uh, staffing shortages. Um, so I do think that the, you know, we call it consumerism, but it's really just patient and human behavior. They're, they're going to demand um, price transparency. I think that um, the frustration with not knowing how much something is going to cost you is, is, going to be unacceptable uh, moving forward. And we all, it's going to take a collective effort um, by providers, payers, you know, regulators to, to fix that problem. Dr. McGill, interesting point on the physician and, and uh, clinician burnout. Uh, do you see the, the change in technology opening a door as well for some of these, these folks that may be uh, reaching the end of their career to extend it or to uh, operate in a different way than they have in the past too? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that we've really tried to, to implement in that um, as 
maybe physician, and we saw this with the EHR, um, you know, a lot of physicians, you know, retired early um, because of the EHR. I, I think that, you know, I think we're past the EHR um, implementation and some of those, those uh, situations and creating the burnout. But I do think that it opens the door for uh, the ability to do virtual visits from their home only a couple hours a day and not, not have to, 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 to put themselves in harm's way. Uh, we've, we've even investigated can um, retired physicians or providers almost act as active physician provider extenders. And so can they help with some of the day-to-day uh, -day management functions of refills and in-basket messages and other things? And so what we hope is that people don't, because they have a knowledge base and a skill set that we just can't let walk out of the healthcare uh, industry. If we do that, then shame on all of us for letting that happen because of the, the years of training and expertise that, that it takes to become a nurse or a physician. And so we have to find ways to keep them engaged and included. And I do think that technology, virtual care, um, remote patient monitoring, some of those things are perfect. Whereas for a busy clinician or bu busy physician in their office are viewed sometimes as a burden or one other thing let's use some of these other, let's get creative and, and have it take some of the work off of them as well. Mm -hmm. Nicole, last but not least. Yeah, so I think just to pick up on what Dr. Reiser and Dr. McGill said about um, the workforce shortage can totally relate in the pharmacy setting. Um, and I think one you know trend moving forward that we need to contend with is the fact that even just this past year, um, with the latest, you know, stimulus package um, that Congress passed and President Biden just signed last week, that has significant health care implications because it increases the generosity of subsidies um, in the Affordable Care Act market plans and expands coverage in other ways as well. So I think, you know, it's, it's a great thing to um, extend coverage to more people so that there are fewer people uninsured, fewer people ending up in the hospitals for their primary mode of care. Um, but what does that mean for this workforce shortage and the ability to meet the demand of all these people who um, may now finally have health insurance for the first time? Um, and so I think that's just one piece that in the future we'll you know, collectively have to deal with, um, but it's an encouraging step forward. And then I think the other point that I'm encouraged by um, is, you know, using technology to help improve transparency. I think the consumer facing real time benefit tool that is in the works um, can certainly give people the information that they need to even, you know, come to their doctor's office saying, you know, hey, this is, I, you know, I've been on this medication doc, um, you know, this becoming a little unaffordable for me, you know, I looked at this app, here are some other options, just to be able to, you know, have a back and forth conversation with real numbers. And the, the other encouraging part about the tool is that if it's linked to a person's insurance plan, they might actually be able to get a, you know, fairly accurate um, copay estimation ahead of time. And so they can really start planning around and budgeting for all of these other things that people are um, having to having to deal with. So that's, um, I'm, as you can see, I'm an internal optimist, but I acknowledge all of the other challenges and the things that we have to face, but I think you know, we're only moving up from here. Excellent, excellent. So as we move to more of the open mic questions from the audience, I'll start out with one of the easier ones. Uh, there was a question about how do we get access to the, the medication access report? Uh, you can go to uh, go.covermymeds.com forward slash medication access report and find it there. Um, another question we received, have you seen situations where physicians are not prescribing the better medication to patients because of the patient not having a better insurance? How do we find the balance of giving the patient adequate medication in their affordability range? Yeah. That situation, and I'm sure Dr. Reiser will, will concur, that situation happens hundreds or thousands of times a day. It happens um, many times when I'm in, in clinic seeing patients, you know, you have a conversation of, um, and, and diabetes and, and high blood pressure are probably the two disease states where, you know, it, as a primary care physician that we deal with 
uh, the most in a situation that, that you know that they need to be on a certain medication, they can't afford it, it it's not affordable, it's not covered, and so they get um, a less effective um, medication. And so sometimes you do have to get very creative with your treatment plans um, for, for some of these situations. I would absolutely agree, Dr. McGill. It, it happens all the time. And now, certainly over the past several years, we've had the ability to see whether patients fill their prescription or not. Um, and I think that's pretty standard across the board now in most electronic medical records. And so as you have that conversation with the patient about it doesn't appear like you've gotten your medication in the last month or in the last two months, and then you try and ascertain what the barriers are to get that medication, then you start to have that conversation about what medication can I prescribe that maybe they could take it every other day and what medication can I prescribe that they can possibly afford to get because it does come down to getting it at all or getting something that may not be as efficacious as something else, but at least I'm making some kind of headway for them. It's a, it's a very, very difficult conversation and it's a very difficult decision for the physician because you want them to have the, the best that you can give them. And clearly, I think all of us try and provide healthcare that is equitable across the board there is no discrimination in my office and trying to make that happen for every single one within the barriers that each patient brings is really difficult and they are hard decisions and they are negotiations. Yeah. And the only thing I'll add there from the patient perspective is, you know, even when you're thinking about, you know, how do you know if something's going to be affordable, just the copay alone is a small piece of total cost of care, right? If we're talking about infusions, what are the transportation costs for the patient to get to the office? How hard will that be? And even, you know, thinking about health literacy in general and insurance terms, like deductible, you know, if someone is not expecting, you know, they think they're paying a $20 copay, but they haven't reached their deductible yet and their out of pocket is much higher, they might not pick up that prescription that day, even though their copay would have been a lot lower. So I think there's a lot of um, education and awareness that advocates can do to help educate people about what even to expect um, when it comes to picking up prescriptions and just their treatment in general. Great. Um, Nicole, this one may be uh, for you. Medication access barriers can be even more challenging for patients who speak a second language or hearing impaired or blind, et cetera. Uh, how can this be addressed? I wish I knew the, the silver bullet for that one, but I think when it comes to, you know, accessibility for different languages, you know, English, English as a second language or um, people who are hard of hearing and, you know, other um, people with disabilities who may need a little bit more assistance when learning about this information, I think the more that um, people can be upfront and you know ask their providers, ask the office, ask their insurance company for assistance, only in creating the demand for it will you know something actually change. Um, but I think there's a lot that community um, health workers and um, other you know ancillary staff can help to bridge those gaps. Yeah, you know, this was something that we saw. Um, as well, and I think that uh, early in the pandemic, when when the the initial shift to virtual visits happened, um, it, it was a struggle, and um, a lot of the initial platforms that we launched didn't allow for three way communications. It, it was it was a point to point, so you couldn't have a third party, whether a translator um, or a, um, interpreter uh, on the line, you know, on the video visit, and so. Um, I think it, it highlighted that the, the technology needed to pivot really quickly to include multi-party. Uh, some of the vendors have done that um, successfully. And, um, you know, I think it's been, um, again, to Nicole's point, it's, it's something that, that we have to address or continue to address. We experienced it as an organization as well. Uh, so as we shifted our business, running our business virtually, uh, even aside from patient care, we have 
you know, uh, hearing impaired employees um, that if you're on a, a meeting and, and not everybody's on video and they're used to reading lips, they couldn't. And so we actually uh, turned on um, closed captioning for meetings if needed uh, in those situations, which, you know, not all platforms offer closed captioning. And so that's another gap uh, just with not from a patient, but just, you know, running a running a business and an organization uh, in society. So here's a uh, potential follow up question. Uh, what are some specific ways you've increased patient engagement, particularly for patients who are hesitant to talk or don't want to talk to multiple people about their health? Well, it, when we're talking about health or, or if we're talking specifically about social determinants, you know, one way that we've that we've engaged is or, or tried to increase engagement is to to make the screening and assessment done outside of the exam room. You know, there's always a, um, a there's always been a dynamic in the exam room uh, between a physician and a patient. You know, some people call it the the power gradient. You know, it's my knowledgeable or financially, um, and so we try and we try and uh, to the earlier comment, you know, really level the playing field, allow them to answer the questions when they feel comfortable. So there's no no judgment that occurs, and then. Um, get them connected to the resources that, that they need. Um, and like I said before, it's really done in a, a respectful manner, um, not in an in a intrusive, um, you know, we're asking you personal information, um, but it's really done, done from the point of trying to help people uh, get, their, get their needs addressed. I think that also speaks to, you know, the flexibility that many health systems have, you know, kind of adapted and changed and built resources, telehealth tip sheets, you know, how to prepare for certain visits. And I guess it's just a matter of connecting people, you know, so that they know where to find it. Um, and maybe that's something that, you know, as part of a visit, people will start to, you know, expect. And the other part of this is, you know, normalizing the conversations that you're describing, Dr. McGill. Um, our community campaigns at MPAF aim to do just that, you know, normalizing these conversations, but it really starts, you know, it, it's very word of mouth, right? It's, you know, starts from, you know, if you tell a friend or a family member that you've had this experience and they trust you, so they may follow suit and feel more comfortable having those conversations with their respective care teams. So I think it's, that's what I was referring to when I said, you know, a slow and steady sort of culture shift. Um, to be able to have these conversations more often. One of the ways that we've tried to frame up the virtual care, this goes back to the question on age is, you know, a lot of times to come to an in-person visit, an elderly patient needs assistance. They need assistance either with driving, transportation, they need assistance with getting into the office, whether they're, you know, on a mobility device or something, something similar. And so we really try and frame the same situation with virtual care and to say, you know, historically, you needed someone to help you in, get in, in and out of the office. You know, you may need someone to help you with your video visit. So is there a, a, a loved one or, a, you know, a spouse or a child or a grandchild that could help you with your visit to break down some of those barriers? But again, it's, it's, it, it, to Nicole's point, it has to be, it, it's going to be slow culture change with, with everything that we've discussed today. Beautiful. Uh, we may have time for one more here. Uh, I'm curious about the price transparency rules where it relates to prescriptions on the provider side. Is there anything built into either the hospital and payer guidance that relates specifically to medication price transparency? Anyone on the panel have a, a thought on that one? Not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. I'm not um, aware of no. anything. It's all procedure, it's all hospital procedure based. If we're talking about the, uh, you know, the mandate to, to publish the prices online, the charge master is really what you're, what, what you're mandated to publish. And obviously medications, um, as we've been talking about it today, don't apply to that charge master. Okay. And then, uh, do you envision prior authorization to be embedded in pharmacist workflow and play a role in helping to address uh, medication affordability? Yeah, I would say 
electronic prior authorization and just you know adjudicating claims has always been part of the pharmacy workflow. You know, now the most efficient way, you know, maybe not every pharmacy has um, you know the most efficient way to do it, um, but I think tools like the electronic electronic prior auth um, that can you know simplify the process and make it easier, and even you know dedicating specific staff to claims management, I think um, can make a big difference in just the time it takes from denial or from you know running the claim to when it's dispensed to the patient. But again, to the point that we made earlier, you know, putting it in the pharmacist workflow, you at that point you have limited options if a medication is not covered. And so it, if it's not covered and you can't get a and the pharmacist can't get a prior authorization, it requires a message back to the to the provider. Do you want to change it? Um, it goes back to the it's a it in some ways it becomes a circular argument. Prescribe a medication, it's not covered, message back, you know, not covered. What do you want to prescribe? I don't know what's covered try something else, oh, that's not covered. Either. I mean, it's just, and, and all the time, the patient is just caught in this limbo of needing their medication, wanting to take their medication. And we're not even talking about an affordability question at this point. We're talking about, you know, uh, just a process to get their medication. And uh, that's incredibly frustrating for a lot of people. And what it causes them to do is just throw their hands up and say, all right, I'm not taking it and, and never go pick it up. So you had all this time, energy, and effort wasted to get a prescription covered that's then never picked up. All right. With, uh, with that, we'll wrap up today's conversation. Uh, thank you again for joining us today, Nicole, uh, Dr. Reiser, and Dr. McGill. And thank you to everyone who dialed in to the discussion. I'll hand the mic back to the health team so we can learn from our mixologist guest. Uh, thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate this time together. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you to David and to all of our panelists. If you'd like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now, please welcome Master Metallurgist Natasha. Hi there. I'm Natasha Soto Albor. I'm Rich Strayer. And we are husband and wife. Together, we are Violet and Vine of New York. Correct. And we focus on um, seasonal craft cocktails, wine education, and essentially kind of upping your cocktail and beverage game at home. So that's what yes. we're going to do today. Perfect. She's going to get you started with a alcoholic-based cocktail, um, which is the perfect thing for the morning. And then I'm <laughs> going to hit you with a non-alcoholic cocktail or a mocktail, which is probably better for you in the morning. And this one implies a little bit of egg white or incorporates a little bit of egg white. So perfect for that. But Natasha, you take it away. Sure. So um, what's fun about this, I think the last time we were here with um, some of you maybe uh, was back in more in the winter and now we're obviously moving into spring. So tons of different ingredients that we're starting to play with. I personally love spring cocktails. We get some great fruit flavors different herbs that are, you know, really like at peak in the spring. So for this first cocktail, we're not quite in strawberry season yet, but I'm, I, I wanna tease the summer a little bit for you. Um, so I'm doing a tequila cocktail with some macerated strawberry, a little bit of white pepper tincture that I made, I'll explain that in a moment, and fresh lemon juice. So it's gonna be overall very well balanced, not too sweet, not too tart, little bit of heat from that white pepper. And I think with tequila cocktails, we're used to spicy tequila cocktails. They're very popular. I love them. A lot of times they're incorporating jalapeno pepper or serrano pepper. The white pepper or using even like peppercorns, Szechuan or black peppercorns, it's a different kind of heat, kind of hits the tongue and the palate um, a little more uniquely. So we're super excited about this one. So I'm going to jump right into it and tell you what I did. To macerate strawberries, um, the idea of maceration with fruit, basically I chop some strawberries into quarters, I destemmed them, and then I throw a little bit of sugar on top um, and I let it sit. And basically that sugar is sort of incorporating into the strawberries, drawing out that really great fruit flavor and sort of acting as our simple syrup in the drink. So when I'm macerating the berries with that sugar, there's no need for me to do any other kind of sweetener, honey, simple syrup, anything like that. We get plenty of that from the fruit itself. Um, so I'm gonna do a big spoonful of my macerated strawberries. It's gonna go right into my shaker. And then I 
am using Blanco tequila. So uh, this is tequila uno, dos, tres, organic tequila, a little bit of a smaller producer, really excellent. Any Blanco silver tequila will do. We're definitely sticking with that in this cocktail versus an aged tequila, just because we're looking for like a brighter, more fresh summery flavor. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do two ounces of the tequila. Again, I put everything in my shaker first. We always talk about this. It's really important to not put the ice first because when we do that, we're essentially already watering down the drink as we build it if we have the ice sitting there for a long time. So ice always comes last. So, so far I have my strawberry, my two ounces of tequila. I'm gonna do three quarters of an ounce of fresh lemon juice. Now, fresh juice is also something that's really important and it makes the difference between those craft cocktails that we get at an amazing cocktail bar versus when we maybe skimp and like cut corners and buy that, you know, lemon juice that's on the shelf in the grocery store. So no judgment, but if you can take five minutes and squeeze some fresh citrus, it always makes a tremendous difference. Um, we're gonna put Aperol in this drink. You're probably familiar with this, the infamous Aperol spritz, the, the drink of summer, especially in New York City and patios and sidewalk cafes. Um, it's great in other cocktails too, though. It's a bitter, but it also has a hint of sweetness. It's not as intense as Campari, but it's certainly kind of like um, Campari's nicer little sister. So we're gonna do one quarter ounce of Aperol. We don't need a lot of it. And then let's talk about the white pepper tincture really fast. So what is a tincture? Basically, uh, sort of a, a flavored, sort of concoction that's meant to be used in a dropper stopper or very small amount kind of like bitters if you want to think of it that way it's more of a seasoning for the drink rather than a main component i made my tincture by actually heating a quarter cup of blanco tequila in a saucepan and then i did a quarter teaspoon of ground white pepper um, straight out of my cabinet where I have all my baking and cooking spices. Um, I let it kind of come to a boil and stirred it pretty vigorously. You could even use a whisk, just trying to incorporate that white pepper in, let it cool, and then I put it in a little dropper stopper bottle and it's ready to go. Um, white pepper is intense, so you're not going to want to use a lot of it. I'm just doing two small drops right into the drink. So now I have everything built in my I'm using a, a glass and metal kind of shape. I'm gonna add my ice. And we're gonna shake. Now, a word about shaking. You always wanna do it super vigorously. It's not just for show. We really wanna get it as cold as can be to the point that like your hands are almost like, oh, I can't take this anymore. That's when you're shaking a cocktail to the right level of chilled, Yes. So if you want, go. you can count the number of shakes that it takes to get there for you. That was That's about good. That's about good for me. 42 shakes. 42 shakes. Um, I'm doing this cocktail in a rocks glass over a big ice cube. That's a presentation I really like. We see it more for old fashions or Manhattans or Negronis. Equally awesome to present something with citrus like that. So my large ice cube goes straight into my rocks glass. I take my Hawthorne strainer. If you've seen this in your bar kit, that's what that's for. It's to strain your cocktail if your shaker doesn't have a strainer built in. I'm gonna wanna double strain though as well. So you can see I have a um, fine mesh strainer here. That's to catch all those little strawberry bits because I don't want those actually going into the drink. I wanna strain them out. So I go straight onto my ice cube here. The color is absolutely gorgeous. It's like this very light sunset kind of pink color. Just tap out the excess. Sometimes when you're running something through the fine mesh strainer, you need to give it a little tap on the side just to get the liquid to go through. So then for my garnish, I'm doing a long lemon spiral. So we're all familiar with sort of the standard lemon twist, right? Looks kind of short, it's a little rectangular. When I make a long spiral, I'll, I'll bring it a little closer to the camera for you. It's about that long. I did that by using a knife and sort of trimming it up nicely. And then I use my fingers to sort of twist it into a curly cue. 
and I, I, it, it almost looks like a little spring. And I sort of hold it together like this, twisting, curling, letting it kind of squeeze and stretch to form that shape. And then I lay that right on top of the drink. So we have this beautiful pink, large ice cube color. I'm gonna taste it because of course you have to taste what you make, right? Mm -hmm. And Rich is gonna taste it for approval. But it's really great. It's, it's delicate, it's summery, it's refreshing. The tequila comes through nicely, the strawberry. Um, highly, highly recommend that sitting outside on the porch in June. Yeah. That's that kind of energy. So I really like, like that addition of the white pepper tincture because yeah. it makes those sweeter drinks a little more complex. There's no reason you, can ha you can't have a refreshing summertime sort of drink without complexity. It doesn't have to be all juice and sugar. It can be savory as well to give you that balance. Totally. So that is our cocktail. It's called That's My Jam by the way, that's my jam is what we named that one. I'm gonna let Rich take it away with our zero proof cocktail or mocktail. Yes, lots of cool things happening in the world of zero proof and non-alcoholic cocktails and spirits and things these days. Um, and really because, you know, people like the complexity of a cocktail but they don't always wanna feel the effects of a cocktail. Um, and so there are a lot of products that have been made in the past couple of years. One of our favorites here is Seedlip. Uh, and I'm going to use one of their products today, their Grove, which is a combination of several different citrus peels, ginger, a little bit of lemongrass. So all of those really bright, fresh citrusy and slightly earthy flavors, creating a, a really complex little bit. And what they do is they distill all of those things together with a little bit of water, and then you get this beautiful distilled non-alcoholic spirit. Uh, really adds a lot of complexity. Then the rest of our ingredients you'll probably recognize from your pantry. Um, and probably we will have seen on your breakfast table this morning. Uh, <laughs> one of them is honey. In this case, we've added half a cup of honey to a quarter cup of sugar, put that on the stove top and then cooled it back down again. So you get this beautiful honey syrup. Use whatever honey you want. I like orange blossom honey. This is just store-bought bear honey, really fun. Uh, and then the second is kind of an ode or goodbye to winter, uh, cara cara orange juice. So this is that, looks like a navel orange, but the flesh inside is pink and you can see it has that beautiful orange but slightly ruby color as well. Almost looks like ruby red grapefruit. Uh, and then we're also gonna use the beautiful herb mint. I love this herb. Uh, complete, uh, very, very, very uh, not ambidextrous. What's the word? Uh, it is ambidextrous. It's ambidextrous, it's diverse. <laughs> diverse. That was the word I was looking for. <laughs> and then our kind of off the beaten path ingredient this is egg white. Egg um, I, white. I think people like to, they like to shout at egg white a little bit. Um, it's not a scary thing. Um, and when you combine it with the uh, citrus juice here, you're actually gonna kill off a lot of those things. It, it, like think of it in, in the way that ceviche does the same thing in uh, you know, some of those raw fish preparations, but we're not using fish here. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna combine all of our ingredients into a shaker. I'm gonna start with this seed lip. That's one full ounce of seed lip. And this cocktail is called Breakfast of Champions. Yes. Because obviously we're, we're using orange juice, we're using egg white. It's kind of, you know, breakfast reminiscent, but definitely can be a really cool evening uh, non-alcoholic cocktail. Absolutely. And then we have one and a half ounces of orange juice. So this is really your dominant flavor here. Right in the glass. Then three quarter ounces, so almost to the top of my one ounce side of my jigger here of the honey syrup. And then we do my mint leaves, two, four, let's do six. Six mint leaves. And then lastly, about one ounce yeah, egg white. it's probably close to one egg white usually equals close to an ounce. So there it is. That's one whole it. egg white right yeah. there. I'm measuring it. And then the last bit for fun, savory with sweet. This is a pinch of salt. We're using kosher salt in this case, but you can also use sea salt. And then like most traditional sours, we're going to shake it dry. And the reason 
reason we do that is we We're want to kind of begin sure. the emulsification process. Exactly. So when we say a dry shake, we just mean don't add your ice yet. So you can see how frothy it's already getting on my glass shaker there. And then we're going to add our ice. Five cubes for me. Looking good. <laughs> that one requires a really good shake. Anytime you're using egg white, you really need to incorporate it, whip it up, froth it. That's when you see an egg white cocktail at a bar, it always has that gorgeous sort of cloud-like texture and that's where you're getting that. And you'll see that starting to pour out of the glass. So here I have my coupe glass, the uh, one modeled after Marie Antoinette's anatomy. And you can see it's just this beautiful frothy whiteness. And then you'll start to see as it separates that beautiful orangey sort of pink color will come out in far from the caracara orange juice. And we left the caracara orange juice unstrained. You know, I think there are two different kinds of breakfast people. There's the pulp or no pulp. We're definitely pulp people here. Um, and then we're just going to do a very simple garnish. I'm taking one leaf of mint, I'm going to slap it for a little aromatics. And I'm going to lay it right on top. Boom. Gorgeous. You're going to bring now, it up to the camera so you can see that texture. See that separation of colors, that texture, that mint leaf on top. If you want to, if you don't really like the smell or the flavor of the egg white, you can spritz a little bit of the uh, lemon oil from a lemon peel on top. I don't mind it. I really like it. And I think it's just a really cool little fun I think what's super fun about this mocktail in particular Ooh. is it really looks like a craft cocktail. Sometimes we can always have mocktails that are like in a tall glass with club soda and the presentation gets a little bit repetitive. Yeah. This, this is a really great And one. it really tastes like a cocktail. If you didn't, if you told me there was alcohol in this, I would probably believe you. Mm. So those are- And you have a mustache. <laughs> you get a foam, a foam mustache. Mm. Um, but those are our two spring cocktails today. Again, I'm Natasha. And I'm Rich. And we are Violet and Vine of New York. You can find us on Instagram at Violet and Vine of NY. We always post cocktail tips and photos. You can ask us questions about what's on your shelf at home and what you should do with it. Um, but until next time, it's so wonderful to see you all. Enjoy the um, incoming spring weather and have an amazing afternoon. Yeah, pretend it's not raining. <laughs>